Uh, but I just want to take a moment to welcome you all to the new season of the Lunch and Learn, uh, which is sponsored by the Friends of the Rogers Public Library, who we are very grateful to. Um, I'm Leslie Canarium. I'm not Judy Casey. I don't usually do this, but I'm up here because I'm the person who gets to book all these wonderful speakers. So if you notice on the back by the cookies, there's two sheets of paper. Uh, and one of them, if you have any suggestions or ideas or wish list of future things you want me to get uh, presentations on, I'll do my best. The other one is if you do not get the uh, monthly email and you want to get on that list, please give us your name and your email. Judy did want me to caution you. We're going to be trying a new email system uh, next month, which should hopefully make things a little more private and secure for you, but it will also look a little bit different. So don't freak out. Um, and if you don't get the email next month, and you should, let us know so we can figure out what's, what's going on with that system. And anyway, Chief Jenkins. Well, oh, thank you. I got, I got one, some applause already. That's a big deal. <laughs> the, only, the most important thing today is that if the police ever come and talk to you, you just have to tell them how awesome the fire department was. <laughs> Even if I don't meet your expectations, it's just always some form of healthy competition with them. So uh, real quickly, I'm going to use the microphone that way everybody can hear me okay. And if I'm too loud or too soft, certainly tell me. So um, here's, here's kind of the plan today is I, I want to visit with you a little bit about your fire department. I want, to, I want you to make sure that uh, you walk out of here maybe understanding wh what your tax money goes for. Uh, bet between police and fire, we spend for every uh, penny of sales tax that you contribute to the city of Rogers, uh, we take up about a half of that. So public safety is a very, very expensive uh, thing to have. Um, I, uh, I'm not a Rogers native, but uh, I, I guess I consider myself an adopted son. I'm an Okie, and uh, I've been here for eight years now, so I'm, I'm hardly new. As a matter of fact, I'm one of the more uh, tenured chiefs along uh, the interstate now. But uh, I, 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 I love this community, and one of, the, uh, one of the things I love most about Rogers that is different, characteristically different than most Northwest Arkansas cities, is that um, they, when it comes to public safety, they both... Uh, talk the talk and walk the walk. And so uh, your elected representatives on the city council and your mayor, um, when we have problems, and, and you understand when, when fire and, and certainly uh, our partners in the police department, when we have problems that we have to solve, whether that's staffing, whether that's equipment or training and all that stuff, uh, you know, you're, t you're, talking, you're talking about people's lives, right? You're talking about their well-being, you're talking about uh, the quality uh, health care they receive in our case and so um, I'm, I'm delighted having worked in other cities and having been involved where I get to see how other communities deal with public safety problems uh, I can tell you as a public safety advocate that we are very very fortunate in this city to have the kind of support with our elected officials that we do and I think it's important that I pass that along to you um, because as a department head it makes my job really really tough if I have to do a lot of convincing and, and more convincing and so it's nice that when we have a problem in this city and we can articulate a good cost-effective solution for that problem we get a lot of support uh, out of our city council and out of our mayor and so uh, that's that's a wonderful thing and so I'm very fortunate for a fire chief I've got a very easy job I have a very good job and, and we often say in the fire department that's the best job in the world and uh, I watch my folks. My folks were in public education. I don't know if anybody else worked in the school system here ever, but I watched my folks go to, uh, go to work for 30 plus years in the school system, and that's what caused me to decide to join the fire department. <laughs> is, uh, I decided I was going to have a job that I wanted to go to every day, and I've managed to pull that off for uh, 18 years, so I'm, I'm very fortunate. Um, well, going forward, uh, we're going to we're going to visit about the fire department. I want to give you a little orientation. For some of you, this may be reviewed. You may know quite a bit about what your fire department does, how it's composed, uh, what we do day in and day out. Then again, I think for uh, the vast majority of you, you may have very little clue as to what those big red trucks are all about and how we spend our time and our effort and our energy. And uh, I want to leave plenty of time for questions. So I'm going to try not to bore you with a monologue. I'm going to try to make it interactive. Uh, and that sort of thing. I wanted to start off, I may have somebody, uh, if we're able to kill the light, are we able to kill the light somewhere easily? Uh, if we're able to do that, I wanted to start off real quick with a video. I think it's interesting. Um, the fire department does a lot of stuff, but one of the most uh, 
traditional things we do, of course, is fight fire. And so this is a video. We have cameras on a lot of our helmets. And so this is a video from just, uh, oh, a few months ago uh, from the Midtown section of Rogers. And I wanted to, it looks like we're absent, um, it looks like we're absent audio. And so based on the language of some of our firefighters during high stress situations, that may actually be a good thing. So uh, we'll just assume they were reading. We may actually, if we're able to kill all the lights, that may be better as long as nobody will go to sleep. That's a, that's a pretty dim video. So this is a helmet camera. They're, they're going to a call right now. Oh, no. And uh, I want you to get a kind of a glimpse uh, without, any, without any audio of, of kind of what this looks like. Uh, when, you, when you have firefighters, it's about 3 o'clock in the morning. So these firefighters just uh, about 90 seconds ago were awakened out of their sleep. Um, they're going uh, to a call that's a reported fire. And uh, I want you to see kind of some of, the, uh, some of the things they have to experience and go through here. So they're pulling up. And I'll skip ahead real quick to make sure that the video is working. All right. There we go. So they turned on that camera while they were going to a call. And so you see them getting out of a truck, and I, I think it's always interesting to, this is, there's very few times in your life you get to see your tax money work for you. And so I want you all to enjoy this moment as best you can. And so these are firefighters going uh, to a house fire in the middle of the, of the night, and, uh, and that you see them put down their helmet, they're putting on their breathing mask, breathing air masks. They carry those tanks full of breathing air on their back that protects their lungs and allows us to get inside a house that's full of real uh, toxic smoke. And if, we, if there are people in there that need to be rescued, uh, then we can pull them out. Matter of fact, we did something just like that a couple of weeks ago, uh, just off of uh, 13th Street in Dixieland, in Ro or 13th Street in, uh, in uh, Laurel in Rogers. And so uh, you'll get to see, once this firefighter puts on his helmet, uh, this house that's uh, enveloped in flames. And what's interesting about, uh, what's interesting about this fire is there, there's somebody that we end up getting somebody that was uh, severely burned out of this fire right in the middle of the night. And, uh, and you can see that uh, this is a fire that has progressed to enough of a state that it, it'll begin, if we don't get it under control pretty quickly, right, this begins to threaten adjacent homes, right? So you could be sleeping in your house and if your fire department's not up to snuff, uh, your, your neighbor's poor fire prevention can begin to impact you. And this is the most dangerous time of the day to have a fire is uh, in the middle of the night, right? So this is, uh, this is why it's important that when you go home today, I hope that you'll make sure that you have good working smoke detectors and that if you do have those good working smoke detectors, that those batteries have been replaced. We try every time that you, uh, you adjust the, uh, the time for the for the time change that you replace those batteries to make sure they're viable. So this firefighter's walking around the side of the house and, and although the camera has a tough time adjusting, you can see that there's flames coming out of several windows uh, and they're trying to figure out a way in. And uh, you can imagine uh, the heat, you can imagine the stress, and you can imagine uh, what this firefighter's pulse is like in the middle of the night uh, looking at a situation like this. So I think it's important that one of the things, I'll, I'll stop this video now, and if, you all don't mind turning on the lights. I think it's important that one of the things we remember is that while your fire department does a lot of stuff, matter of fact, uh, the term fire department's almost a misnomer anymore, right? Because we do a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with fire. Uh, fire is still a, a very important and dangerous thing. Fire will kill more people than all other natural disasters combined, right? So you think about how many people fear of tornadoes, right? And there's, there might be people in here who have tornado shelters, right? And there's tornado shelters, and there's all these things uh, that we worry about. We worry about terrorism, we worry about flooding, but it is fire that remains the most dangerous form of disaster, right? And it, and it conquers people and it kills people uh, all the time, right? Every year in the city of Rogers, we will have uh, dozens of people affected by fire. And what I mean by affected by fire, that means injured or killed. And so this is a problem that is homegrown. We don't have tornadoes that strike every every year in Rogers that kill people or that injure people, but fire is still a, a thing. And so I want to start off with uh, just that gentle reminder that one of the things I want you to do, would be, it, would, it would really make me mad to have 
anybody in here that I spoke to that didn't take some time to, to check your smoke detectors, right, and make sure that your home is properly protected from the risk of fire because it's still a uh, real thing. So let me get out of this and I'll get back into my presentation real quick now that we've uh, looked at a little video. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, a little bit about who we are. So we have uh, seven fire stations spread throughout the city. So by a show of hands, how many of you live inside the city limits of Rogers? And now uh, there's some people that live on, in Benton County, right? So how many are Benton, rural Benton County residents outside the city? Where, so Rocky Branch, we talked before. Where, where, just out of curiosity, where do you live? Bella Vista. Bella Vista, that's almost as good as Rogers. And um, you have to understand, I'm very biased, right? Uh, what other communities might be here today? Prairie Creek. Prairie Creek, okay, that's good. Where else? Centerton. Centerton, okay, that's good. So um, you can see in the city of Rogers that uh, there's seven strategically placed fire stations. The city of Rogers is 38 and a quarter square miles. And so one of the first obligations of the fire department is to make sure that we have resource, resources that are distributed out so that we can get to your home quickly. That uh, the job of the fire service is that uh, when you have an emergency, right, and everybody generally in their life at least one time will experience an emergency that you have to summon the fire department. That may be a fire, that's the most obvious thing, but more often than not, it's uh, something other than a fire. And so I think it's important that you realize that you may have to call upon us. And I think one of the things I would like for you to do, and it doesn't matter if you live in Bella Vista, or you live in Centerton, or you live in Rocky Branch, is I want you to take some time and figure out what fire station is closest to your home. And if you don't know which fire station responds to your home, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a question I could probably give you a pretty healthy answer to. And I want you to, I want you to know that that's a neighborhood fire station. That, those are, that's, that is your tax money. They are there sleeping, eating, living, training, preparing, listening to the radio, ready to, ready to risk their life for you at a moment's notice, right? It is, uh, it is a job that certainly none of them got into for the money. Not that it's bad money, but it's certainly not anybody, nobody's going to get rich from the fire department. Uh, but I think it's important that you know where those people are that are, have, have taken an oath to protect you, because they take that very seriously. And uh, I have the great fortune of working with them all the time. And so uh, you can kind of see where those fire stations are. And I hope that as you'll, maybe after today, and maybe you do this already, that when you travel through communities, pay attention to uh, where those fire stations are. I think it's, I think it's neat that uh, one of the things we really have worked on in Rogers is that we want our fire stations to be visible. We want them to be cornerstones of their little, their little geographic niches of the community. We want them to be places that if kids have a flat tire on their bicycle, they feel comfortable going to the fire station because they know the firefighters will take care of them and that they're always safe there. We want bus stops at the fire stations, right? Because I think parents have a high degree of confidence in government, government employees that wear a firefighter's uniform. Matter of fact, year in and year out, uh, the most trusted government profession is that of a firefighter. And I think if you look in your own heart, uh, maybe you'll see that too. I hope you do. Hope it doesn't get any worse after visiting with me today anyway. What's so, the, oh, I'm sorry. What's the star in the middle between what, four? That is a great question. So uh, all of these little circles here, these are fire stations. This little uh, diamond thing in the middle is over here at uh, the 3100 block of West Oak Street. And in the 3100 block of West Oak Street, near the Animal Shelter in Rogers, if you know where that is, is our training center. So we, uh, what, what makes us, I think, uh, different, uh, maybe a different point of emphasis in our city, is we put a lot of time and money and people into professional development. That, that you, don't, you, don't only, you, just, you don't want three numbskull firefighters to show up to your house at 3 o'clock in the morning if you're having chest pain. You don't want uh, three average firefighters showing up on the interstate if you've been rear-ended and your neck hurts. You want brain surgeons. You want rocket scientists, right? You want the most capable minds that, the, that the, the city could offer. And so that diamond is your training center in the city of Rogers. Uh, former Mayor John Sampier uh, had, uh, with the chief at the time, uh, Ken Riley, had the vision in the late 90s, when Rogers was not the city it was today, that we needed, a, we needed to build a facility just to train our firefighters, both in classroom uh, experience, and they also needed to have a facility where they could do practical hands-on training. And they built that facility, and it was underutilized for a long time, but today uh, we, we have outgrown it already. And we rebuilt it right after I became fire chief a couple years into it. So it's a wonderful facility. It's used regionally, so I think it's a fine example of government working the way it's supposed to where other firefighters from Fayetteville to Springdale to Bentonville to Bella Vista to Centerton, 
uh, will come over and use our facility and train with us because it's a team it's a team job right you don't really care what the back of the shirt or the truck says when it pulls up to your house you just want to see a fire department there and you want them to know what the heck they're supposed to do and so uh, that's a that's a wonderful benefit to our community is having that training center so excellent question so here's a little question here's a little uh, here's a little survey I want to do today I'm always interested in these answers is I would like to know uh, what services you think your fire department provides what do we do what do we do but not fires. Okay, that's the most, that's the easiest question. If we didn't get that off the ground, I was going to be nervous. What else do we do? We have paramedics. We have paramedics. So we do emergency health care. What else do we do? Anybody know? First, no wrong answers. First response. We do first response. So a lot of times we're the first people there on the scenes of emergencies. Very true. What else? Educate. We educate. We educate people. Uh, we want people. We, we would prefer to prevent bad things from happening. So we put a lot of time, effort, and energy into that. We unfortunately do get cats out of trees. Those are. We've actually had a little uptick in that lately, so I know that sounds like a joke, but but in all honesty, you th how many of you have pets? Everybody got a pet in here? Anybody got a cat, right? And if you're really nervous about uh, Mr. Kitty, and Mr. Kitty's 40 feet up, there's not a lot of people you can call. And uh, we will, we, we will if we, we think the situation warrants it, uh, and we don't have anything that's more urgent to do, we'll, we'll go help uh, the kitty cats, or the dogs stuck in storm drains, we've had that this year. So uh, we try to help animals out, just like our human friends, if we have the resources. We don't. The stickers on the windows, um, uh, well, I tell you what, save that question for the very end. I think some of those are perfect. So here's what your fire department does. In 2015, statistically, uh, we did a lot of stuff. But that big green slice of the pie is the emergency medical component of your fire department. So uh, in the early 1970s, uh, the city of Rogers, long before it was popular in our nation's fire service, took over the ambulance service. And the reason the ambulance service belongs in the fire department, and I've worked in, I've worked for cities where the ambulance was not part of the fire department, and I, uh, I've obviously worked for some where it is. The reason it belongs there is think about fire stations, right? Fire stations are strategically placed throughout the city so that we can get to your house in a really short period of time. Now, originally, those fire stations are placed due to fire. But if you're having a heart attack, don't you want them to show up really damn quick? Because that's, that's what I'm thinking, right? If I'm feeling really bad and it's a time-sensitive medical emergency, I want some brain surgeons, I want some really smart guys and gals to show up there really quick. And so it makes sense to cross-train firefighters as both EMTs, which is a little lower level of care, and paramedics. And so in the city of Rogers, we operate uh, four advanced life support paramedic ambulances and ambulances are not taxis right taxis that we don't we don't provide trips to the hospital we're there to save lives and we're there to make sure that when somebody has a time sensitive medical emergency something like breathing problems something like chest pain that could be a heart attack uh, somebody who's who's not as as alert as they should be or is completely unconscious those types of medical emergencies it makes sense for them to belong in fire stations because those fire stations are designed and built so that we can get there in about four minutes. And so that's the bulk of it, right? That's 73%. Uh, I know that's a little hard to see, so I'll tell you what it says. 73%. Uh, fires is a whopping 7%. And then we do a lot of other stuff. We do false alarms. There's alarms that go off, and we have to, if it's a real, if it's a real fire, it goes in the other slice of the pie. But we do a lot of false alarms. There's quite a few uh, businesses that are required by the International Fire Code to install alarms. And so we have to go check those out, and we want them to be false, right? We would prefer not to have a lot of blazes in the mall in the downtown community. So we want, we like that number, I guess. Uh, we also go uh, to a lot of other stuff: good intent calls, service calls. Those would be the cats in the tree. Those would be uh, people calling us to investigate smoke, uh, natural gas leaks. We go to. We're also your street chemist, is what I call them. But that, I guess, the technical term is uh, hazardous materials people. All right, so if there's dangerous chemicals that are on the ground, if there's a, uh, a manufacturing facility or a transportation uh, problem uh, that involves a hazardous chemical, leaking a gas, leaking a solid, leaking a liquid, say somebody does a uh, white powder scare, right? Remember when anthrax was a thing immediately following uh, September the 11th, 2001? We are the people that solve that. Uh, and we do it in Rogers very well. Uh, our, our folks, over 90% of our firefighters are certified as hazardous materials technicians, which is, a, which is the highest level of certification to manage that stuff. And so when I say street chemist, uh, that's not necessarily tongue-in-cheek. Uh, these guys and gals out there, uh, they know their chemistry, they know the interactions of oxidizers and flammable material and corrosivity and 
they're able to speak that language just like you would expect maybe a, a high school chemistry teacher to and, and of course they have to they have to deal with it right they have to solve the problem and protect the environment protect people and protect property so you can see we do a whole lot of stuff that the fire department if you have a problem and it is urgent and it if it doesn't need somebody with a gun right if it needs somebody with a gun you call law enforcement but if it's not a gun that's going to solve the problem in general you call your fire department that we do a lot we have people that uh, uh, we, we just do a whole spectrum of things to make sure we're taking care of our community and we're proud to do that so uh, by the numbers a few little uh, statistics that may be of interest to you is that uh, there's about 117 sworn firefighters in the city of Rogers you can compare that to other communities this is a this is an area that we use to compare the market so these are some Oklahoma cities nearby and of course North Little Rock Fayetteville Springdale so in the region, we have a pretty healthy number of firefighters. The important thing to consider there is in both Rogers and Springdale, and if you're familiar with Oklahoma, Broken Arrow, those are all departments that are running the ambulance service with the fire department. And so I think that's a real cost-effective way to do business, and I also think it's the best for the citizens. So that's a win-win in my book. Uh, you can see that it's a busy place that in the city of Rogers last year 7,020 times the bell went off in the stations uh, to alert them to an emergency and that could that's you know any, everything from fires to airplane crashes to people having heart attacks to uh, anything that they decided was uh, important enough to dial 911 and summon the fire department and of the 7,020 uh, times we were called we ended up taking patients to the hospital about 5,000 times. So this little graph down here shows you how many total patients we treated, how many of those patients we took to hospitals, and uh, reflects all the emphasis we put on our ambulance service. And for some of you, I suspected we would have a few that lived outside the city. And this, this is a little hard to read just because of the colors I chose, and that's unfortunate, but um, this shows uh, where we run outside the city. So we made, we're responsible in the city of Rogers for the Highway 12 corridor to the Madison and Carroll County lines. And we also protect the Highway 90 in the east area towards Horseshoe Bend. And so there's a lot of area that is outside the city that we provide the ambulance for. Um, so the, where were my Prairie Creek folks earlier? Where were you all hiding? Prairie Creek, so we, we take care of you, we take care of Rocky Branch. And, uh, and of course, uh, we also, uh, from a fire standpoint, if there's fires out there, more often than not, we'll be summoned to go out there and help most of the agencies outside the city our volunteer and so sometimes they need the career firefighters uh, to come in there so uh, a couple other things is that while we get busier a uh, point of pride and I'll, I'll, I'll speak to why I think this is here in just a little bit is that the loss of property due to fire so the amount of, of buildings and, and contents that has been destroyed over the last several years uh, has gone down last year was the busiest it's ever been and we lost uh, the least amount of property and so if you're going to be busy, you certainly don't want people's belongings to be threatened. And that's a good thing. So it's good that we're not seeing high property loss. But as I mentioned earlier, in the city, right, these citizens that are just like you and they're just like me, we had four of them that we had to take to the hospital because they were exposed to fire. We had one die last week or the week before uh, in a house fire where we pulled them out. And unfortunately, uh, while we pulled them out alive and we were able to get them to a hospital, they died. And so I don't want to underemphasize that fire is still a thing. That it's easy for me to do this presentation and I talk a lot about ambulances and I talk a lot about all these other things that we do that you may not think about, but um, we still do a lot of fire. And so I look at the fire department kind of like your cell phone, right? That uh, if you had a cell phone in the 90s, you did one thing with it, what did you do with it? You made phone calls, right? Now, uh, I'm going to imagine there's a lot of people using cell phones today and you're doing a lot of stuff on it. But you're probably not making near as many phone calls, right? And that's kind of like the fire department, that we have this traditional mission, making phone calls, but we also have all this other stuff that we do now that we didn't use to do. And it belongs with us. It's appropriate for us to do it because we're people that are trained and we're positioned to make a difference. But it is, uh, it is a, it's a comprehensive and expanding mission that we tackle. So I think that it's important that you understand uh, kind of philosophically what your fire department's all about. And what those guys and gals that are in the stations that are, that, like I said earlier, that are living there, that, are, that have made a career to be on the fire department, um, what, what we share with them, uh, their, their, what, what, what we think the city's expectations are. And so I put these on the screen. There's a few of them. First of all, we want sick and injured people to receive first class medical attention. That uh, I, I just briefly said earlier, ambulances are not taxis, and they're not. Uh, sometimes you know, we run into people who say, hey, I need a ride to a hospital. 
Um, so we're going to call 911. That's not what an ambulance is for. Uh, because that same ambulance that may be given somebody uh, out of the goodness of their heart to ride to the hospital now is unavailable for somebody who has a true medical emergency, right? We have to get the next closest ambulance. And that's not, if you're that person or that's your loved one having a problem, that's not what you want. Uh, ambulances in the city of Rogers provide the same care you can get in an emergency room. And we can do that in your living room. And that's a wonderful thing. That it, it is our opinion, and it's really the opinion of multiple studies nationwide, that if you're going to save lives in a time-sensitive medical emergency, we've got to come to you, right? That the best medicine is not to drive as quick as you can to the hospital. The best thing to do is call 911. And uh, it's, it's my opinion we shouldn't even call ambulances ambulances. The state of Texas, years ago, uh, stopped calling ambulances ambulances. They call them mobile intensive care units. And you know what? That's spot on. That's spot on. And if you talk, if you, if you talk to the young men and women that staff those ambulances, you'll find out that their body of knowledge and their skill uh, would rival any medical professional you've experienced uh, in your life. Uh, and that's, that's opinion, I suppose, but uh, I feel very strongly about it. The other thing we want to make sure is that fires are contained to minimize property loss and all lives are saved. Fire's a thing. Um, in the city of Rogers, we run about one fire per day. It's not a lot. But you understand that fires can quickly grow to threaten adjacent properties, and they, can, they threaten. If somebody has a heart attack in your home, that doesn't threaten all the other people in your home, right? But if you get a fire to break out in your home, uh, that puts everybody there at risk. It also puts our firefighters at risk. And so one of the things that we have prioritized through the acquisition of equipment, through training, and through uh, increase in staffing over, over certainly the time I've been chief, is that we want to make sure we get our arms around fires quick. And, uh, and that we, we make sure that we can find, we want to, our goal is that we get there and however we find it when we get there, it never gets any worse. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, sometimes the, 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 the fire gods, I call them, have us lined up for something else and sometimes we'll get our butts kicked, but it's pretty rare. We have a very well-oiled team, a very well-prepared team. Um, and so they understand that when we get there, we want to save your property, which is important, but it's only second to your life. And, uh, and they do a pretty good job of that, and I mentioned a few examples of that earlier. Uh, when, I, when I did the question at, at the start, I said, what do we do? And I was impressed that somebody said, educate, because oftentimes you don't think of that. And, and uh, the police department, uh, police services, law enforcement in general, uh, about 20 years ago started a process called community policing. That ring a bell with any of you? And the idea was that you know, these officers were more visible to the public, they developed relationships, uh, on the, in the neighborhoods and with business owners such that they kind of felt this connection. And I feel the same way about firefighters, right? That, that uh, we, we generally are very popular in the community because we're, we never write you tickets, I guess. And, uh, and we're, there, we're there on your worst days, right? You're gonna have a really bad day someday. That's just inevitable. And when you do, we wanna come there and we wanna make you feel better. We wanna take care of you. And, uh, and, and that's a sincere, that's, that's, a, that's the motivation that a lot of these men and women use to get on the job and join the fire department. Well, the other thing we want to do is we want to prevent and mitigate emergencies before they happen. And so in the city of Rogers, we, do, we spend a lot of time uh, talking to our young kids. And uh, we spend time with them when they're young, and we teach them that if their clothes catch fire, they do what? So some, you all got that somewhere too, right? You know, you know where you got that. You got that, from your, you got that from a firefighter somewhere, so it worked. And they're going to grow old knowing that. We also teach them to get out, stay out. Right? If your house catches on fire, you don't get little, uh, you don't get little Susie's cat, you don't get little Johnny's dog, you don't get your favorite toy, you don't get your favorite jacket, you don't worry about your backpack. You get out of the house, stay out of the house, and you have a meeting place. Uh, we tell them to practice exit drills in the home. Right? We want them to practice as if they have a fire and practice what they do and what to do if the doorknob's hot. And we do all that stuff with our young, our young children. And now, starting in about 2011, we also engage them in middle school. And this is what kind of makes us a little different, I think, is that uh, we get those middle schoolers and we teach them CPR. And we've engaged those middle schoolers because what we want to see is we want to see a community saturated with people who know how to save lives. Right? We want to see communities that are saturated with people that know that if somebody has uh, a cardiac arrest, right, if somebody has a real deal heart attack, that CPR is what's going to save them. It's not all the fancy stuff we have on the fire department. It's early CPR. And, uh, and, you know, maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe I should tell my mayor and city council I need some more fancy, you know, equipment. But the fact of the matter is it's CPR that makes a big difference in saving those lives. And so we get those middle schoolers, right? And we, and we engage them because people are more likely to jump in and help in an emergency if they've been exposed and trained as to what to do. And, uh, 
And so I think that that's wonderful that we continue to do that. And of course, we, I mean, I think the favorite, probably my most favorite thing I do is doing stuff like this. I love interacting with our community. I love going to visit Rotary. And it's amazing to me uh, the kind of support we have. We have a wonderful city. Um, you know, it's it, by far the best in the state, best in the region. And I'm uh, and certainly no offense to people who live elsewhere. That's not what it was intended. But uh, I got to root for the home team because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud of it. This is a wonderful city, wonderful people to protect. We expect, uh, you should expect that your fire department gives you a friendly, reliable, and quick response when you need, when you need help. Right? That, that you kind of have that whether an emergency is time sensitive, whether you experience an emergency really is you to decide. You pick up the phone and dial 911. You should expect that in a very quick order, you have uh, somebody who's knowledgeable, somebody who cares, somebody who is friendly, somebody who is reliable to help solve your problem. Right? And that may be your pilot, but we get those two. You know, somebody's pilot light blew out and they smell gas and they just want to make sure it's okay. They're, uh, they, 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 they're, they have smoke detectors beeping and they want to make sure that it's not carbon monoxide or, or something else going on. We, we get those calls all the time, but you should expect that. Right? Where your tax money at work, you should expect us to get there quick, be friendly to you, solve your problem. Uh, you should also expect equipment training and expertise for any emergency that doesn't require a gun. So this is a presentation you can tell I've used for years. That, uh, that we've taken on a lot of job responsibilities that uh, decades ago were not part of the fire department. And, and it's not just emergency medical stuff. And so uh, you, for those of you that live in the city of Rogers in 2011, you passed a bond issue. It's actually an extension of an existing one cent sales tax that uh, for us purchased nearly $5 million worth of equipment to make sure that uh, when we show up to your house that the transmission on the fire truck is still good and to make sure that we have all the hoses and nozzles and tools and ladders and all those specialty things that we don't use every day. But when, when you need them, you need them, right? And uh, so for those of you that, were, that live in the city and that voted for that 2011 uh, one cent sales tax extension on behalf of your fire department, thanks. You've, you've, you've made your city safer and you've also made us safer, right? Good equipment keeps us safe too. The other thing that we're big on is transparency and performance. And I hope you kind of get that today. And we collect a lot of data. The decisions we make are very data-driven, that uh, the way to solve problems, unfortunately, we don't live in a world where we can just throw money at problems over and over again. That some problems do take money, that's just the fact of life. But we wanna make sure that when we uh, go to our city council, or that when I approach my boss, Mayor Hines, that, that we're, we're asking for things that, are, that, that can be defended in data, and that we have uh, researched the solutions that are alternatives, and that we make sure that whatever we're asking for is appropriate and that we can deliver that project on time and on, on target. And I think one of, the way that we, one of the ways that we continue to elicit support from our citizens and elicit support from our elected officials is to make sure that, that we share the data with them. We let them know what we're doing. We let them know how we're performing. And so if you go to our website, best evidence of this is that if you go to our website, uh, rogersar.gov slash fire, uh, there's a section called Documents and Downloads, and you can see month by month how well we do responding to cardiac arrest. You can see how many people we save and how many people we do not save. You can see how much, how much, how many, uh, how much dollar loss we had to fire in the month of May and how much we had in the month of July. And we have that for years and years and years going back so that you as a citizen can find out how good is your fire department doing. And, uh, and I think that's important. I live here too, so it's important to me. And I want to make sure that, uh, that, that we're working hard for your money because that's what it is. So uh, in the state of Arkansas, and really in, in a multi-state region, uh, we do a lot of good stuff in Rogers. And I, I think I told you that that's not a singular thing. That's not just the fire department. That's us working in conjunction uh, with our elected officials, working with uh, my boss, um, who are all very supportive. And it's also working with uh, a lot of other agencies, Rogers Water Utility. So you, everybody pays a water bill, including me, but the Rogers Water Utility, that's, those are good folks who understand that for us to do our job, if we want to look like heroes, we got to have pipes in the ground. We got to have fire hydrants, right? You take away fire hydrants, we don't look like heroes. We look like zeros, right? We look like a bunch of idiots because we have to have water. That's one of those things you got to have to look cool as a firefighter. Um, the police department's another one. The 911 center is part of the police department, and we rely on the police a lot to help us with traffic control, to help us solve uh, more complex emergencies. And those folks, and it, it, sometimes you'll you'll read or you'll see on the news, you know, this rift between police and fire. And I'm I'm on my third police chief is, since I've been the fire chief and uh, it, it's almost like they just keep getting better in a lot of ways and uh, th that is a wonderful organization. Police have a tough job. Uh, they're not always as popular in the community just by the nature of their work 
but I will tell you, Rogers, that's a that's a class act, and uh, you know, and, and he's the police chief, so I'll never compliment if he was here. But Hayes Miner is your police chief, and he's 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 first of all, he's a friend, right? We've developed that friendship just in the time that uh, we've gotten to work together. But more importantly, he's a professional, right? And uh, he knows what the heck he's doing. Uh, he's a law enforcement officer that understands the complexities of 21st century law enforcement and, uh, and we're in lockstep together. And that makes a difference in your city, right? Because we're going to have the bad things happen in good places. And having those relationships and having the opportunity to train together, to work together, to converse, that means that when bad things happen in Rogers, and more importantly because of the size of our community in Benton County and Northwest Arkansas in general, we're going to be head and shoulders above some other cities because we have such a good professional relationship between the two entities. So uh, what are we doing to, to keep on a good pace? Well, one of the things that we, we really prioritize within the department is all about leadership. That uh, all of us in the fire department are replaceable, right? And uh, my mayor may wake up tomorrow and decide that uh, I'm a knucklehead and, it's, and that my expiration date has arrived and, and then it's time for me to go down the road. And if, that's, if that happens, uh, it's our priority that we have a multitude of, of leadership options to pick from. And so I'm hoping that he'll come while I'm here. But a fine example of this is that the newest chief in Siloam Springs, is a, he's a Rogers alumni, right? He was a Rogers firefighter, and we trained him. And he was part of this group that we really started pushing, right, and, and providing educational and training opportunities, uh, getting them opportunities from, for promotions within the fire department to expand their decision making. And then what happens? We have another local community who says, that guy's a good leader. We're just going to take him. We're going to rob him. Now, we, were, we were essentially a farm team. There's no finer compliment to our city right? than when other cities go, we want your people. Uh, the, a deputy chief I had just a few years ago uh, is now the fire chief in Kingman, Arizona. They shipped him across country um, because he had that kind of value. And so that, that's, Sometimes you struggle for evidence you're doing the right thing, but when you, if you're training people to be leaders and you're giving them those opportunities and people are robbing them from you, no finer compliment in the world than to see those people go off, make a difference, and kind of be uh, disciples of the city of Rogers. You were the youngest one they ever hired. Yeah, I, I had a lady call me uh, probably a year ago, and she was mad about something. She was hacked. This, I don't get many calls like this, and she... She asked me what my authority was and how old I was, and I told her, and she goes, Sir, I do not think you have the wisdom, age, and authority to be making these decisions. And I told her, Ma'am, I could not agree more with you. I, it's, uh, it scares the bejesus out of me that they have me making these decisions, but by golly, for eight years, they've got, they, there's no other option in the city right now. I definitely have a lot more gray hair than I did when I started, I promise you. Uh, the other thing we do, and, and you kind of got that through transparency, is we measure everything that we do everything that we do we measure because the only way you improve is if you know how you're performing right you measure and you improve and you measure and you improve uh, if you go in our central fire station downtown on north first street we i've got signs in the office that just say measure and improve because that's important to us that when i uh, probably the best example of that and i may touch on this in another slide i can't remember but um in 2011 we uh, started measuring cardiac arrest performance to see how many people lived. If we encountered them and they were having a, a real deal heart attack, which means they were clinically dead. Chest pains, and sometimes th these are muddy waters, but if you're in cardiac arrest, uh, secondary to a cardiovascular compromise, you're clinically dead, right? These are people you're doing CPR on, for instance. And we looked at all those people, about 100 a year is what we see in Rogers that meet that definition. And we said, how many as a percentage of those people do we save? And the percentage was 7%. And you all probably don't know if that's good or bad or otherwise, so I'll tell you, it's horrible. Um, it was embarrassing. And uh, we said, you know, we're going to do better. And the city had the, the foresight to say, uh, you know, we'll get behind you, Jenkins, on whatever we need to do, but we've got to save more people than that. And we shipped our butts off to Seattle, uh, King County, Washington, and started copying what Seattle and King County have been doing since the 1960s. And in Rogers now, uh, it's probably the best place you could have a heart attack nationwide, uh, or at least among uh, an elite list of cities that if you, something really bad happened to your heart, uh, if you can live, this is where you can probably pull through. And that number has gone from about 7% to every year it hovers in and around 40%. And that's no small thing, right? That's a, lot of kid, that's, a lot, that's a lot of kids that get to see their parents and grandparents at their soccer games, at their high school graduations, and all that stuff. And so uh, 
not to be melodramatic, but there's very few times government gets to save your life. But every now and then, if you're paying that sales tax, maybe uh, maybe you'll look at it a little more favorably next time. So we got to measure in order to know what we're doing. We try to collaborate a lot, um, specifically with the cities of Springdale and Fayetteville. Um, being an Oki, the, the fire chief in Fayetteville's from the city of Tulsa. I've known him uh, most of my life and all of my career. And the fire chief in Springdale in particular, Mike Irwin, uh, is out of Lee's Summit, Missouri, so they're both outsiders. And we have a wonderful relationship with those large neighbors. Uh, we also work hand in hand with some of our local volunteer fire departments. So Jerry, Oliver, we talked about Jerry Oliver out in Rocky Branch. I had conversations, email conversations this morning with uh, Mr. Wisenant, the chief in uh, Beaver Lake. And so we, we try to collaborate. That you know, you get a lot of governmental entities, and things always tend to go a little better if we can all get along, and we can all be on the same sheet of music. And when that doesn't happen, you know how that goes too. Um, we also try to use technology a lot. So you saw helmet cam footage earlier, right? We, we, we learn from that. We don't have that just so we can have cool videos out there. Um, matter of fact, we don't even publish them publicly. We use that information to say, how is our training doing? How did we perform? And a lot of times we do really good. And then sometimes we look at those videos and we go, oh my God, we, we can't do this. This is not, this piece of equipment is slowing us down. Uh, or this, the way we're doing this training does not make sense. We've got to adapt and figure out a better way to deploy this hose or to raise this ladder. And so you can see this, there's countless uh, elements of evidence that technology is a big part of what we do. So I talked a lot, uh, I'm going to try to wrap up quick here so I can take questions. We talk a lot about uh, you know, transparency and trying to get better and all that stuff, but uh, you know, one of the things that we believe in in the city is having outside validation. That For me to stand up here as the fire chief and tell you how great the fire department is, that's not really all that far as a, of a journey, right? I mean, it kind of makes sense that any, if you were the, were the CEO of a business, you're going to tell people how awesome your business is, and if you're the fire chief, you probably think your fire department's pretty good. And so what we do is we spend a little bit of money, about $10,000 a year, to have outside evaluators come in here and look at both our ambulance program, that's the Commission on, uh, Commission on Accreditation of Ambulance Services, and we also have the Commission on Fire Accreditation International come in, and they look at how we respond, they look at our response time performance, they look at how quickly we slide down the pole, we look at how quickly the 911 center processes, processes calls and how accurate that call processing is, they look at our policies, our procedures, our training records, and, and they rake us over the coals. And then they get to determine, based on that independent recommendation, whether or not we receive these stickers that go on the side of our truck. And, uh, and we've got them. We've had them both. Uh, we got the first one in 2011. We just, last month, uh, were re-accredited for another five-year term through 2021. And our ambulance accreditation was redone in 2015. That's on a three-year cycle. Uh, what's interesting is our police department is accredited, too. And when you add those accreditations together, and I may have in another slide, oh, it even says it here, I'm sorry. Uh, we, we just in the very end of 2014 received notification that we were, we had the lowest insurance rating. So on a scale of 1 to 10, every fire department in the country, all 33,000 of them are rated on that scale of 1 to 10. 10 being the worst, and so you pay the highest homeowner's insurance premiums, and 1 being the best, and you pay the lowest homeowner's insurance premiums. And uh, we were fortunate enough to be a one. We're the only one in the area. Yeah, all these accreditations together, you get with our police comrades, and what you find is that we're a unique city of about one in four across the entire country that has all that stuff. And these aren't, th th this is not, uh, these are not feathers. This is, we're not being a peacock and just showing you all our pretty feathers. This, this stuff is hard to get. And, and it's important to me because you gotta have evidence that you're doing the right stuff. Everybody's got an opinion. But when you have outside experts, we had uh, when this last accreditation cycle, uh, firefighters from Metropolitan City, Toronto was down here, so Canadian, you know, down here checking out how we do business in Rogers, Arkansas, uh, Charleston, uh, Denver, and, and Kansas City, right? So these are, these are respected metropolitan areas uh, with, with subject matter experts that we're, that's what we pay for is to fly them in here and we pay for them to give us a bunch of headaches for a week and rake us over the coals. Doesn't make a lot of sense, but I hope it does make you feel better about how we invest our time and more importantly, all of our taxpayer money. So it's, uh, it's not just my opinion, I promise it is outside influence too. We, uh, I was glad earlier you asked about that diamond and I said that's our training center. And uh, one of the most important things we do is we train our firefighters. Now we don't want our firefighters to um, always uh, be at the training center. We want them to also be at fire stations from time to time, right? That's important. They need to be uh, in your neighborhoods ready to protect you. But we do book up a considerable amount of their time uh, to make sure they're training. 
And uh, we train entry-level firefighters here. So in the Northwest Arkansas area, we take everybody's rookie firefighters here in Rogers and we turn them into actual firefighters. Over a 12 to 18 week process depends on the fire department. Everybody's kind of got different requirements. Uh, we train, of course, on emergency medicine. We train how to command and control incidents. We train on developing good leaders and officers that we still have to, uh, for those of you that worked in business and industry, right, you still have supervision and, and all of those, those leadership philosophies that we have to make sure we have out there. And uh, this is the number of hours we train per year. We have about 100, we have 128 employees of the fire department, 117 of those, including me, are sworn firefighters. And so those firefighters are training tens of thousands of hours a year. And what I think is important is to look how that number grows. And, and so, you know, just because you don't hear sirens at, uh, coming from your local fire station doesn't mean those guys and gals have been in there watching TV and uh, sitting in recliners. It means that we try to book up every, some portion of every day they have with training. And then what is miraculous to me and says a lot about the men and women that, that work uh, in our fire department is that uh, they do a lot more than they have to, right? They, they occupy their own time and they want to be the best. Right? And they don't mind training a little extra and doing some on their own, and that's really a wonderful thing. And so these, these uh, pictures are hard to see, but this is just some of the stuff over the last year, right? Dealing with a flammable gas fire, the training for that, they're in the embassy suites, uh, hotel practicing uh, deployment of hose in multi-story buildings. They're uh, here in a concrete, this is, this is supposed to simulate a collapsed building. We carry a lot of equipment that if we have a Joplin tornado happen here in Rogers, there's a lot of stuff sitting right downtown with a lot of people who know how to use it that, that we can start rescuing people hours ahead of any other option and certainly hours ahead of Joplin had to wait for us, right? So uh, we're, we're, in a, we're in a good circumstance. And then sometimes you, know, you have people that are window washers and that you may have to click, pick off of the side of a building and we have to be ready for those sorts of emergencies too. Cars that go off the side of bridges is another example of that. So I talked to you a little bit about uh, the bond and how important that was. And so we've, we've replaced the fleet uh, uh, one time over since I've been chief. But uh, I'll just tell you, you know, fire truck probably looks like a fire truck to you. So I don't expect you to be fire truck experts. But the apparatus and the equipment and the facilities in this city are uh, head and shoulders above any city I've ever visited. And, uh, and I, I, uh, I'm heavily involved in our International Chiefs Association. And I travel just enough for it to be a pain in the butt. And I get to see a lot of different fire departments. And I'm telling you, right here in Rogers, Arkansas, um, we have a community that has done a good job taking care of this. That's you all, right? Spe specifically, that bond issue uh, just did wonderful things for us. We have a program. I talked to you about uh, earlier about the uh, middle school kids, and we train them in CPR. And, um, and uh, we have a program called CPR Rogers. And I know that's super clever, right? The Rogers and CPR in the same building. And, um, but here's what this program is all about, is we spend a lot of time trying to make sure that people know how to do CPR. And I'm not talking about healthcare provider CPR that we would be trained on, or nurses or doctors or whoever else. Uh, we try to train people on what they call friends and family CPR, that where you're most likely to interact with a dead person that you may be able to bring back to life is going to be a loved one, right? That's, and that's, that's, the, that's when you're most likely to see them, and that's when you're most likely to, to be willing to step up and, and do something. And uh, so what we've done is uh, we've trained a lot of people, over 35,000, which is about half the population of the city since 2011. We've got a lot of uh, protocols in place, but one of the pieces of homework, I gave you one piece of homework, I uh, really two, I wanted you to check your smoke detectors, and I wanted you to uh, also figure out which fire station protected you but the other thing I want you to do is, if you don't know CPR, right? You, and I'm not talking about have, you have to carry a card, but if you don't know how to do CPR, that if, it, if a loved one or a neighbor or a friend experienced a time-sensitive cardiac arrest, dropped to the ground dead, if you don't know what to do, uh, then I handed out business cards. And so we look for opportunities to make sure people know what to do, because you're the difference. It's not us, it's you. And the other thing you can do, if you ever want to, if you, if you do know how to do CPR, you can also be called uh, part of what we call our citizen responders. So there is, how many people have smartphones, Androids or Apple, is that a lot, of, a lot of people in here? Well, there's an app, it's free, called PulsePoint out there. And this PulsePoint app does a couple of things for you. First of all, if you so desire, you can tell this app that you know how to do CPR. And if we have a cardiac arrest, if you're sitting at Olive Garden and over here on 46th Street, New Hope, 
and somebody at Red Lobster has a heart attack, so if you're within a quarter mile of that emergency, it'll send you a little notification. It'll say, hey, there's somebody who needs CPR that is really close to you, because you could beat us there. And so you, it'll tell you that. And we have time, about 14 times a year, we'll see instances where civilians will intervene, help solve an emergency, uh, because that phone app worked. Um, the other thing you can do on that phone app, you don't have to do the CPR thing, uh, that phone app will also notify you of any big incident that we go on. So you, if you want to know what your fire department's doing, you can download that app. And if, if you don't, if you want to see why the fire truck's down the road, it'll tell you, it may not tell you the exact address, but it'll tell you the general location. And you'll be able to see what the problem is that we're there to solve. And so it's a neat way to kind of see what your fire department's doing. So I would ask that if you have a smartphone, download this app. If you can't figure out how to do it or you have trouble locating it, uh, that's what my business card's there for. And so, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, does Arkansas have a good Samaritan law? Yes, Arkansas, believe it or not, has a very robust good Samaritan law, which even include, includes the use of defibrillators. So if you shock somebody as a civilian, you're covered. And of course, they have to be alive to sue you anyway, so if you get them back alive. <laughs> I don't see it being uh, too big of a deal. So let me, uh, let me real quickly tell you kind of what's uh, next for us, and then I'll leave me just a little bit of time for questions, and I think I'm tracking right is that our next fire station is in the planning stages. So uh, our next fire station is going to go in the extreme southwest corner of the city. This is very difficult to see, uh, but this is the Shadow Valley Country Club area. This is the Pinnacle Hills Country Club area. There's an extensive road construction project involving Pleasant Grove Road and then Southgate Road that runs, this is an old uh, photo now, but will run somewhere in here. I think it actually jumps up like that. And we'll go out to Highway 112. And we're going to put a fire station uh, basically across the street from Shadow Valley uh, that will protect the very western edge of our city, which is uh, right now uh, presents us some problems. So I told you that all of our decisions, of course, are based on data, and that's kind of how we found it, is that we modeled uh, the response time out of our different fire stations. So it's Station 5 at the Pinnacle Hills area, Station 6 is over on Bellevue Road, just south of Pleasant Grove Road. And we looked at the number of incidents that occurred uh, in a given year that we did not meet our own goal of being there within four minutes travel time, four minutes drive time. And we're, look at all those calls, right? That's all in Shadow Valley. Uh, those are emergencies for a given year. And so we know that uh, the city, there's a huge subdivision that's going in this little area of the city of Rogers. And there's another subdivision being developed right on this corner, which is about another 50 lots. And so we're seeing a, a very significant amount of population growth. And so our new fire station is going to go about right where that red dot is. And uh, so I thought it important to kind of share with you a real world, world example of how we use data to figure out where we need to invest your tax money, which is a thing. And uh, when we put that fire station uh, in service, so this is proposed station eight, that's in the same basic vicinity. Uh, the last photo I just showed you, um, this, these little, these colored footprints indicate how far we can go in four minutes. And so if it's got that shading, that's good, that's what we wanna see. And what we see over here is that the city limit boundary is all shaded. And that means that we can meet our goals for those citizens. And uh, that's important to all of us, but of course you have to understand it's especially important to me. So uh, I, I, the ask today is I want you to make sure you know CPR and I want you to consider downloading PulsePoint. I think that's a, I think that's a wonderful tool um, for you to stay engaged with your fire department. And what I'm hoping to do now is I'd love to see what kind of questions or concerns or sudden emotional outbursts I might be able to handle today. So, yes ma'am? Well, places you go, you talk about teaching the kids, what about the seniors? We, uh, we don't have, the nice thing about kids is we've got them corralled already. <laughs> uh, we love to teach seniors. Um, we go, uh, we have a, a very healthy relationship with the Adult Wellness Center. The problem with uh, ret the retired community or senior citizens or whatever kind of group it is, is. Um, is, is finding a large number of them, but we don't shy away from any number. So if there was an opening here, right, we'll come here, we could do a CPR over lunch thing here. It takes probably 20 minutes, but any opportunity you have for us to come and maybe visit with a group of you, we're on it. We love to do it. So I would contact you at the number. Yeah, call me and I'll get you to the right person or I'll handle it myself. Absolutely. We'd love to do it. Love to do it. No group too small. We just teach seniors oh I understand I understand if I was going to educate my parents who would fall into that category I'd have to go to the casino though so it's just rounding them all up they like to spend my inheritance so it's good. Uh, on a carbon dioxide uh -huh. I know we keep my battery up to date but does it ever need to be uh, 
checked for sensitivity? Um, it, it really depends on the model. As a general rule, in both carbon monoxide and smoke detectors, they recommend replacing those at 10 year intervals. Um, if you ever have any doubt, though, you can always call your fire department. We can come out and sample the air um, and see if we detect any trace elements of, that would, you know, be carbon dioxide. Or, excuse me, carbon monoxide. Yeah, carbon so. monoxide. I put a lot of my batteries. I put 20 year batteries in mine, but I test them twice a year. Well, so if you're testing them, really, you know, if we, if we follow the, the recommendation, we really want you to test it every month. Okay. Certainly, 20 year batteries are better than what a lot of people use. Um, we just want to make sure that it's well taken care of. So, even the ones we install now, so if we come out and install a smoke detector, which we do free of charge, we actually do them with life, with 10 year, what they call lifetime batteries, too. Um, but in most people's homes, they're using, uh, you know, just regular Energizer 9 volts that are not designed to be in there for a long time. Um, so just, as long as you're testing it, you should be okay. But there's a question I'm saying. I just had to thank you. I have a now 18-year-old, but when she was 14, she actually has a type of epilepsy where mm -hmm. she'll go into a grand mal seizure and code. Wow. And um, they were at my door in like less than two minutes. I mean, incredibly fast. Oof. Incredibly. But I have her with me again, and she's like, because of guys. Well, that's, that's so the kind of story we want. pretty tremendous stuff. I was very impressed. Well, I'm glad that she's obviously doing it today. I'm <laughs> glad, glad we were up to the occasion. Yes, ma'am. Quite a year ago, the, oh, I'm, go ahead, you're fine, sweetie. In early October of last fall, about 11.30 in the evening, my phone rang, and a voice said, oh, didn't sound like anybody I knew, but I said my daughter's name, and she says, oh, call 911. I just hung up the phone, and I called 911. They answered immediately. I told them that the emergency was not at my house. I live off of Dixieland and Olive. The emergency was at my daughter's house. She's off of Dixieland and Oak. I told them where she was, that I didn't know what was the trouble, but she it was terrified and could seemed like she could hardly breathe. She's dispatching people, we're on the phone, I'm trying to get some clothes on, and I said, as soon as I know they're there, I'm going to hang up and leave here. She said to me, they're at the house. I left, when I got there, they already had her out in the emergency vehicle with pros taking care of her. They told me she's having a heart attack. We're taking her to the hospital. Police officer was there. He says, we're, we're secured the house. I followed the ambulance. The wonderful crew at the hospital knew just what to do. One of her arteries was closed off. They got a stent in. The other arteries are beautiful, and she goes for her one-year checkup next Monday. Good. <laughs> but those people, everybody I dealt with was absolutely kind, calm, considerate, and most of all, very professional. So we met your goals, right? Not just lip service. Exactly. That's good. Absolutely That's good. and more. Yes, sir. You know, I uh, understood that uh, the reason that um, Seattle was one of the best places that sounds really odd, but it was because they had a heart attack. Yeah. 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 Yeah
but that's really where we're going to save lives. I mean, a lot of, I know I got on the job in 1998, and, and uh, you know, my vision of myself is that, man, I, I get to save some lives in these big, glorious fires. And about, um, I don't know, maybe one time a year, Rogers will get to do something really heroic in a fire, but we'll save, uh, save 10 people this today on ambulances. And, uh, and so I think that you'll see that continued emphasis and we'll, we're going to continue to, I, we converse regularly with the people that run the, what they call the Rescue One Foundation in Seattle, which is who does a lot of that education. And so you can rest assured we're, we're, we're right with them. Matter of fact, we, we're hoping one of these days Seattle comes to Rogers to figure out what they need to do next. But maybe that's too boastful. What other questions might you have? I got yes, ma'am. Oh, good. I've done, I have my CPR since the 80s. Good. I renew it every two years like you're supposed to. Mm -hmm. And I just did it this past spring at the Schmeeding Center. And the lady there said that when she became director of taking, you know, teaching the CPR, she sent out over 100 letters to big businesses in the two counties mm -hmm. to, that she would teach their employees for free, mm -hmm. no charge. And not one company took her up on it. She was really disappointed. Yeah, and I don't know why that is. The good, I guess the good news there is we do a lot. We do a lot. We'll come to businesses and, and do some what, law firms and just big, small. And so I think it may be that that, that niche has been filled by fire departments. It, it may not be that they're not doing it. That is a little shocking, though. It's a little for us. That'd be a little frustrating. Three hours. Yeah. Well, and that's probably for certification. Yeah. yeah we just try to get in there and give people some uh, assessment. So any other questions that I can answer for anybody? I, I really appreciate you all. Oh, yes, ma'am. I got one. I got two oh. questions. <laughs> uh, how much does the uniform cost? The protective clothing? Yeah, when they go in, when they're With everything, that's about $3,000. Yeah, including the air tank on the back. It's a lot of them. And you have to replace them, what, every five years? About every 10. This kind of depends on the use. It's recommendations about every 10 years. Somebody that's riding an office desk most of the time, like me, can go a little longer, right? There's people who may, may, need, may need it a little bit more frequently. Well, they tell me that Rocky Branch has a good it's not a one, but it's not two. It is. It is good. Yeah. And yet, most of us, who are my neighbors, they, our insurance company will not give us any kind discount. Well, I would say they're probably with the wrong insurance company. <laughs> <laughs> there are there are some insurance companies that. The insurance companies recognize the work that's put into it. Well, most there's really only one insurance company, and I have to be careful being a governmental employee and a bureaucrat not to disparage any. And you say what? Uh, and recorded, but there is one specific uh, insurance company that, that uses a uh, zip code based system where they look at historical loss and that's really not the right way to do that sort of thing. Because there's a zip code that, I mean, you can be in and out of the city and still share the Roger zip code, so it's better to have it more finite. But good observation. They might want to do a little shopping. That's what I do anyway as a citizen. A any other questions at all? Yes, sir. I believe you said your office is in the downtown Rogers mm -hmm. fire station. Yes, sir. How often do you get out on a call yourself? Oh, uh, well, that's a bad day um, if I'm out on a call. But I would say I probably, I, I don't go to a lot during the day. We, there's a lot, there's there's layers of supervision that make that not a, a good use of my time. And I don't ever want to be seen as a micromanager. What I try to do is usually make some of the overnight fires. So if there's a fire overnight, I think it means more to the guys and the gals to see me there about 2 a.m., right, than it does at 2. If I'm, if I'm there at work anyway, it's probably not that big a deal for me to show up. Um, but I try to make some of the overnight stuff. Now, if it's a multi-alarm thing or if it's something of, of pretty uh, reasonable significance, so a hazardous materials leak, um, something that, that maybe is at a school, uh, that'll get my attention pretty quick and they'll call me and, and make sure I'm aware. But I, I listen all the time. My radio is over here and I stay probably too in touch, uh, I would say. Yes, ma'am? You said guys and gals, just out of curiosity. How many of your firefighters are women? Well, I'm happy to report that we have increased the number of women on the department just in the last year by 100%. <laughs> Uh, two. <laughs> so, two women. And they are wonderful. They are wonderful. The, 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 firef the, the female firefighters that we employ, we're looking and we look for more. Um, they, are, they are phenomenal. They're, they're, they're a much better firefighter uh, than I am. And they're tough and they fit in wonderful. And it's just uh, it's a struggle in the fire department to recruit women. And, and they, uh, they, make, they are shining examples of of uh, all-around good firefighters. One of them's a paramedic. Uh, the other one we just hired out of Minnesota, and so we do a we have a very very large recruitment base. So it's uh, I know that sounds silly, but we we have people that move across the country to to join the fire department here in Rogers, and so that's a neat thing. 
I, I did want to take a second. I mentioned earlier one of one of our we were talking about leadership and training and development of future leaders, and I told you about the guy who got uh, shipped off to Siloam. So this is Jeremy Kreiner. So Jeremy uh, hired on. Hey, he got applause and rock. We don't clap for Siloam. It's like a care. Too competitive. Um, but Jer Jeremy got, got hired on here in 2006, and 2005 I was close. And uh, and he, he was here. He used to be the captain on the ladder down here, the ladder truck down here on uh, Pinnacle Hills Parkway and did a short stint. We have a heavy rescue unit that sits at the new fire station in Station 2. That's a real technical uh, unit, uh, one of the, really the only one outside of Little Rock in the state. And he, he uh, had a really distinguished career here. And, and so now he's, uh, now he's on to uh, better adventures in Siloam. So a lot of Rogers influence in the area. I think that's cool. Any other questions? I don't want to take any time. Yes, ma'am. Are you as good cooks as they make you out to be? I think so. I think so. <laughs> of course, I'm biased. I mean, we have no accreditation for our cooking, but uh, they're pretty good. I think if you look at our kitchens, they, they definitely are equipped to be good cooks. Yes, ma'am? Uh, I just, since she mentioned cooks, uh, I was in New York staying at the Marriott Hotel just before 9-11. Yeah, the one attached to the Trade Center? Yes. Yeah. And the open air area right right next to it was a police, I mean a fire station. Mm -hmm. And I went in and bought a cookbook yeah. that they put together and all of those people were killed. That's good. I mean, like... You said they were killed? It, when the tower, oh, that's not good. <laughs> yeah, because they were right. Yeah, that engine 10 in Latterton, yeah, that, that's a... That's a pretty famous fire station. But I love my cookbook. Well, that's good. That's good. I'm glad you have a cookbook. That is a good thing. So you can put out a cookbook or a calendar? Well, we, we don't. We get, we get asked about the calendar. Uh, 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 but, but with only 117 of us, it doesn't take more than a few years before you're running a little thin on that. I see those calendar sales dipping before too long. Uh, we would probably make it a few years and then be popular. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for your time uh, today. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. My cards are up here, so if there's anything you ever need, please don't hesitate to reach out, and uh, thank you all very much.